of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. And next item is the approval of the minutes. Um, does anybody have any uh, comments, suggestions, edits on the minutes? If not, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. I make a motion that we approve the minutes with any necessary corrections. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Um, so focus discussion, any, any edits to the minutes? There. If there is none, um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, I will be brief in my chair remarks today um, because we have a lot to get through with Dr. Villier. Um, I wanted to address the email that we got from former COB staff member, um, Brenzy Thompson. Um, I did forward that to HR um, and got a response from HR today. Um, basically, um, I'll read out loud verbatim. Um, the concerns were, made, were raised with HR before, um, as she had stated in her letter, um, she had sent me an email before and I promptly told Executive Director Fitchard that she needed to be taking that to HR and not to me. Um, we, um, there is no, um, the concerns were raised by had this former employee appear to be her perception that the director is not performing her primary job functions well and the director's man management style. So the management style complaint was addressed by HR and they found no wrongdoing there. Um, but the perception that the director is not performing her primary job duties is our responsibility, right? Um, specifically, she raised a concern that we are behind on public um, proposed resolution reports. So um, every meeting that we have had here, we hear um, why the reasons why we are still behind on PRRs. Um, and specifically for me, it's the fact that we don't have an established process yet um, to go back and forth with MNPD on this. Um, rather than trying to ram these through all at once, we wanna get the process right um, that way we're not going back and forth for months on these PRRs. That being said, we need to clear the backlog. Um, and I would appreciate it if maybe um, we could form a committee to make sure that we have a process to um, clear that backlog um, and make sure that we're up to date on the PRRs going forward. Um, or process them as quickly as we can um, and establish that procedure with MNPD so that that process goes smoothly. Um, any questions or comments about that in the letter? Um, if there's nothing on that, yes. Thank you, Chair. This is Hildred speaking. Uh, thank you for Thank you for addressing the concern as um, I'm sure that my fellow board members know I'm being assisted with technology. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, fellow board members understand that we are not able to discuss matters with each other outside of a publicly noticed meeting. So I know I'm speaking for myself when I say it was uncomfortable to receive this email and then not know what to do with it, not knowing whether any action was being taken. So I want to express my appreciation to the chair 
for finding process, taking it to HR, receiving something, communicating that to it the us at the beginning of this meeting, and then also bifurcating the issues and suggesting a process going forward. I understand that issue number two, in terms of workload and backlog, is something that you are calling for a committee of board members to assist with. I would like to volunteer to assist with that. I appreciate your emphasis on getting it right first, but I also probably share the community's concern that we have to move forward. We have to know. We don't know if our process is working if we don't get it out here. And if I'm being long-winded, it's been a long time since we've been in this space with our community. And uh, as we know, we always like to include the community in this conversation as much as procedurally possible. So thank you for opening that up. And please note my uh, willingness to volunteer for any committee in this regard going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Uh, Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, I also want to mention and hold that um, the director had mentioned several different times of being short staffed, especially when investigators. So maybe the role of the committee could also be to offer um, suggestions on how we actually clear the backlog of things that actually need to be investigated. Because it feels like those things won't be able to um, be expediated because of the lack of capacity. Thank you, Mr. Kamaguchi. Mr. Hayes. I'd also like to volunteer for, for that committee. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, would anyone else like to volunteer for that committee? Mr. Kamaguchi and Ms. McCree. I volunteer as well. So uh, who's going to be in charge of scheduling a meeting? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ms. McCree. We should move on that as quickly as possible. Um, so thank you all so much for, for stepping up and volunteering to do that. Uh, if there's no more discussion on that, we can move on to um, the executive director's report with Mr. Clausey. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'll go over uh, the report quickly. And if anybody has any questions throughout, feel free to interrupt, or uh, we can hit it up at the end. I uh, will tell you that the office is open. It's, we've been open since July 1st. Uh, we are now mandatory wearing masks in the office. We had been wearing masks in the office before, but the policy changed with Metro buildings. So we didn't really have to make much of a change because we had already been doing that. To give you a personnel update, uh, we are underway in hiring the MNCO community liaison. Those applications have been turned in. Uh, Executive Director Fitchard has those. So um, we have planned, she and I have discussed that we will start setting those up uh, next week when she's back from her vacation. Um, I was also able to onboard our new legal advisor and our new research analyst. And since uh, Mr. Holloway had raised the, the issue of not yet meeting the new people, they are all here tonight. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna briefly introduce them and let them just come up and say quickly who they are and, and what skills they bring. And we'll go from there if that's okay. First, uh, Amy Simmons, I think most of you either saw her or um, heard from her at our retreat. So she, she loves to talk. So she's just gonna come up here and uh, just tell us real briefly where she came from. And, Okay. Well, how's everyone doing? My name is Amy Simmons, and I'm from, uh, I've been with the Oversight Board now a little over a month. Um, I come from DIDD, where I was investigated there for about three years. Um, my previous experience, I was a probation officer with the state for about eight years. I've worked with the Department of Homeland Security, so I bring a lot of experience, and I'm an investigator with Community Oversight. And next, I'll uh, introduce uh, Gavin. Uh, come on up, Gavin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Gavin Kroll Williamson. Um, I come to MNCO, recent graduate of the Community Development and Action Master's Program from Vanderbilt. Um, prior to being here, I was a research coordinator with uh, Metro Arts, the Department of Arts and Culture. Uh, and I come with effectively uh, statistical 
background, policy analysis background, and um, a number of spatial analyses background. Um, I've been following the work of the board uh, before, since before its inception, so I'm very uh, excited to be here with you all. He's our research analyst. Should have mentioned that. No, I, I welcome. And then finally, our legal advisor, Daniel Yoon. Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Yoon, and I was specifically promised I wouldn't have to speak at this time. <laughs> Not by <but> me. <laughs> I won't say by whom, but um, unusual for an attorney. I don't like to talk about myself, but um, I've been in Nashville for 12 years. I've mostly worked at the Nashville Defender's Office. I also worked in private practice for a couple of years. Um, but most importantly, I lived here when Jacquees Clemens was shot and killed and Daniel Hambrick and so many others, so I'm very happy to be at this community oversight board doing the work, um, being here when it got passed in the referendum, and yeah, definitely be thinking about those names and those people and the community that still exists uh, as we do this work together. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. So those are our new members that we've selected. We are also looking at, I uh, just today worked with our HR department and um, finance to get the position approved for our Administrative assistant, as, as some people may know, Paula had decided to move on, so she's no longer with us. Um, so that's, that's part of where we are with the personnel update. As far as our training, we are now the staff, and, and I think a few of the board members are participating in the NACOL uh, conference, the virtual annual conference training. Um, there's 32 individual webinars that we'll be attending, and, and being a part of from now until December of 2021. Then the in-person conference is going to be December 12th through the 16th in Arizona. If anybody wants any more information about that, I know we've talked about it in the past, but that's on the NACO website. As far as specifically, uh, Executive Director Fitchard attended the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing webinar on violent crime prevention. And this month I attended the National uh, Society of Human Resource Management Conference in Nashville, Tennessee which is coming in really handy with the, uh, the hiring of new employees that we've been having and onboarding and, and some, of that, some of that work. So um, as far as board member training, I wanna remind everybody as, as uh, Executive Director Fitchard has in the past that Metro Human Resources Training Division has requested that all boards and commissions register for the required training, which provides a concise overview of Metro's policies and practices as related to sexual harassment prevention and diversity and inclusion. The training is mandatory, and the next online sessions are Thursday, September 23rd, and Tuesday, October 26th. HR has emphasized that you must attend one of these sessions if you haven't taken the training. So if anybody has any questions about getting that registered, there should have been emails that went out, but if you don't have those, like I lose emails as well, feel free to email Jill or I and we will get that information to you. The Citizens Police Academy, MMPD is offering a fall session of the Citizens Police Academy. It's a 13 week session that will begin on Monday, September 27th and end on December 13th. The classes will be held at the Hermitage Precinct and will meet on Mondays from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The COB and MCO members are required, as we all know by state legislation, to attend the Citizens Police Academy. So please inform Executive Director Fitchard if you want to attend the fall session. An application will be sent to you to secure your spot and the deadline to apply is September 10th uh, at 5 p.m. The cap is 25 people, so I'm, I'm assuming from what I saw last year, the sooner the better on getting people in that. As far as community outreach goes, um, we are continually striving to participate in outreach in the community. We obviously don't have a community liaison as of yet. I will tell you that some of the candidates that Jill and I have looked at have looked really good, uh, really promising, so we're excited about that. We know the importance of the community liaison position to the work that we're doing. Um, also, uh, MNPD with uh, uh, Commander Lara had reached out to us about extending an invitation for the MNCO to participate in a recruit, recruit training class. So Exec Executive Director Fitchard, uh, Dr. Valier, and Investigator Vernon Johnson presented the MNPD's uh, current recruit class on the history of the COB, how investigations work, mediation, uh, research, and they, that was all done on Monday, uh, August 16th. We have another day set up where we're gonna do that again, I think in January. 
As far as the MNCO research, Dr. Valier prepared multiple reports for the board, which you all will be talking about here in a little bit, uh, specifically on license plate readers, the MNPD's response to hiring recommendations, and the use of force recommendations. As far as complaints go, the MNCO continues to receive calls from the public to initiate complaints of alleged misconduct. The MNCO has received a total of five investigative complaints since its last board meeting, and we've had two non-complaint calls for service. As far as the MNCO investigations go, uh, I've secured a transcription company that's gonna help us with uh, reducing those long uh, interviews down to where they're easier to digest for not only the investigators, but also for our legal advisor when looking through the, the interviews to find certain things. So that's, that's really good. It's a company that, that I've used before, and I believe that MNPD also has used them for transcription, so they're, they're a reputable company. As far as proposed resolution reports, E.D. Fitcher received an email response from Chief Drake regarding the COB letter sent about the response to the PRR. It stated that he accepted most of the recommendations, but that he needed a little more time uh, to investigate, which was part of the agreement that we discussed with MNPD when we went through the process of saying, you know, if they need more time to respond, he would just simply ask for it. And uh, they are looking into that so that they can give us a more educated response. Uh, Director Fitcher did meet with the Vanderbilt University Chief of Police. We had talked about that at the last board meeting, Mr. August Washington. She met with him on Friday, August 20th. The meeting was to discuss the MOU between the MNPD and the Vanderbilt University Police Department discussion centered on how the COB fits into the agreement and if the COB has authority to oversee complaints related to police misconduct related to the Vanderbilt University Police Department. They agreed to seek legal counsel and meet again in a few weeks. I know that line may sound like there was a, a disconnect. It, it went really well. She, she described the meeting as being very amicable and very friendly, very open. She said that um, Chief Washington was very, very kind, very gracious, and it looks like things will be uh, moving forward in a very positive way when they reconnect. So that was, that was exciting. I was, I was glad to see that happen that way. There was an MNPD policy update that, that Executive Director Fitcher should have sent, I believe sent to everybody. Uh, as a roll call training update that Commander Lara had sent us regarding the MNPD policy manual update of August 18th related to MNPD Form 253. We've talked about that form a lot, um, which created a record of their daily activity that the officers have out on the street. The policy update has correlation to the letter the board sent to uh, Chief Drake regarding the COB, PRR, and the complaint number, which was 2019-26. Uh, if anybody has any questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. I, just a general question. Is there going to be some record of daily activity? There's not, from, from the updated policy, there's not going to be the handwritten form anymore. But they are, from what the policy says, they are uh, categorizing that in the CAD report, and they're going to be making comments and notes in there as well as far as what has occurred. Uh, they're, they're saying that, that um, from what I read, that it's going to be a much more useful uh, tool. So did that answer your question? Um, it, it, for me, it begs another question. Useful for whom? As long as the information is useful for the purposes, we need an investigative complaint for an officer's activity. I, that's great. But I think we need to, I would suggest we take a look at that and stay on top of that. I don't okay. mean to imply it's not going to be, but I would want to know. Right, right. Case. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the background and hiring advisory report. Mr. Clausey. Oh, sorry. I'm, Mr. Holloway I'm and then Mr. Campbell Cooch. Um, the chief of police at Vanderbilt, um, we begin to have a dialogue with them. If there's any way possible, we would like to invite him to when I meet his, at his convenience. Yes, sir. Um, and my, my question is along the same um, lines that the earlier question was posed. It's just like I was curious about the formats of the notes that would be taken on the CAV report, but I think one of your answers just um, answered that question. So am I imagining the right thing that it's just going to be random that the way it sounded is that they're just, just going to put handwritten notes on their daily activities no no report. i'm sorry i, I right. didn't make that clear so there will be and commander laura you're welcome to, to jump up if you want and and not if you don't want to it's that's up to you oh good 
Good evening. Uh, so really the CAD report, uh, our, our CAD report, it records everything that, that the officer does. Any calls for service will go to the CAD. Uh, and also they always put a disposition at the end of the CAD and there's ability to write notes of what their, what the, call, the call for service that they're going to. Um, Apart from that, we also have our ARL, so it will also be able to tell us exactly where the officer is. So there's several different things that are going to come into play that will help us have a more accurate uh, understanding of where the officer is and what kind of call for service he's at. Again, everything is coded. Um, everything is sent to from the dispatcher, or uh, it can be self-initiated into the CAD, uh, and you'll have a record of that that can be pulled out um, you know, with request. So you, you're not going to lose anything. It's just one less piece of paper um, that we're going to have, but it'll all be recorded within the CAD. So I hope that answers somebody's your question, sir. And I should have made it clear, but the CAD stands for a computer-aided dispatch, dispatch, right? Dispatch. So it's all logged in that way. Before I jump into the next one, any other questions? <laughs> okay, great. Um, the background and hiring advisory report, again, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but Chief Drake did respond to the COB's advisory report and provided his reasoning and input for the recommendations. I'll let Dr. Valier talk about that more. We had uh, two officer-involved shootings, unfortunately, one on August 3rd and one on August 11th. Executive Director Fitchard was notified by MNPD officers were involved in a fatal police shooting near Smile Direct, or actually at the Smile Direct in South Nashville. Investigator Johnson and I responded, and then uh, obviously Director Fitchard responded as well. MNPD briefed us when we got there. Uh, TBI also came specifically over, met with us, showed us the scene. Uh, everybody was very cooperative and working with us and showing us and giving us access to things. We were able to actually go uh, and review body cam footage that day as well. And, uh, and TBI is handling that case as of right now. The August 11th uh, shooting was uh, Edie Fitcher was notified again by investigator April Williams, who was on call that, that day, that MNPD officers were involved in a fatal police shooting that occurred in West Nashville. Investigator Williams and Investigator Johnson also responded to the location and were briefed by MNPD and the TBI of the incident and shown uh, the crime scene basically similar as, as the last one I described. Edie Fitchard was briefed as well upon her arrival and the MNCO team went to MNPD headquarters and viewed the available body cam footage that day. TBI agent was present during the viewing of that footage, same with the other one. So that was those two. Um, Body-worn camera updates. Commander Lara has updated us and told us that as of today, or up to date, there are 1,320 of approximately 1,346 active employees equipped with body cams, which is 98% of the authorized employees that are equipped. 740 MNPD vehicles are equipped with the in-car cameras. Uh, Body-worn camera deployments is, is basically 100% complete. Um, to all the precincts. MMPD is currently deploying cameras in specialized units, so that's, that's where I guess the, uh, the small lack of not, you know, the 2% hasn't, hasn't fallen in. And that should be completed in September, and that will end the deployment. There continues to be no unresolved issues with equipment or storage capabilities at, at the MNPD. And then the final two things I will talk about is uh, uh, E.D. Fitcher met with um, Director John Bunton and was updated on uh, public safety initiatives. Director Bunton invited E.D. Fitcher and Dr. Levere, uh, Dr. Valier to participate in the creation of an evaluation process of a program he is currently developing. E.D. Fitcher shared with Dr. Director Bunton an opportunity for the mayor's office to collaborate with the MNCO regarding offering counseling resources for those who are suffering trauma from the violent death of a loved one. Um, and that, that's, those are conversations that the two of them have been having over time. So that, that, there's that. And then the community oversight board opening, I think everybody's aware that there is an opening for um, Dr. Kong. That will be filled by the Metro Council at their meeting on Tuesday, September 7th. The elected individual will fulfill the unexpired term of Dr. Kong, which expires on January 31st of 2024. And that's the end of the report. If anybody has any questions, Mr. Kamaguchi. So I had, excuse me. So I have two. Uh, thank you for that report. I, I, I learned a lot. I had two uh, questions. One was, one one was, and we might not know the answer to this, but 
How many police officer involved shootings have we had this year? Do we know that number? I, the, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I think it's, um, I think it's seven. Okay. Does that sound? Does it's that sound? seven. Seven. Yes. Okay. And then also, I would be curious, and this is just a feeling question. Um, I know last time um, we had this conversation about complaints. There was a tremendous uptick in complaints. In a, at a pay, I remember uh, Director Fisher talking about it was a pace that it was very difficult to keep up with. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if, though, if that has slowed down any. It has. It has. The past month had slowed down quite a bit. And, and there's really no, I could, couldn't even give you a, a reason for that slowdown, but yeah, it did. Mr. Holloway and then Mr. Brown. Uh, yeah, I will come in and also um, question. Uh, we've, uh, what I gathered uh, last week too, that we had seven shooting already this year, more than we had last year at this time. And don't know what's the reason to that, but hopefully that it doesn't continue. Uh, my question also is, uh, what happened if the officer turned off that camera on the incident? There's, I know that there's policies and practices in place for the Metro National Police Department that dictates what they can and cannot do with their body-worn cameras. I can also tell you that the videos that I've, that I've personally seen uh, from the start of this, the officers have been, uh, when they turn them on, have been really diligent about not turning them off until they're ordered to turn them off. So I have seen that. And then I've also seen some officers that didn't turn them on in the first place. And the cameras will start. They are recording. So we do still, we are still able to get footage from those, those cameras. Uh, there is a period of time where there's no audio. But I think they say after the first minute, uh, the audio does kick in. And you can see that. So it is, we are able to tell which officers do not activate their body-worn cameras. And that's something that we will be addressing in our reports as well. But there is, MNPD also has a policy on that. So how they deal with that and how we deal with it, there's a policy in place of how they're supposed to do that. I had a question going back to the uh, report. Looking over the number of complaints that, and the status of them, I noticed that we've got 12 of them that are more than six months old. We've got nine that are more than 12 months old, and some of them say they're pending final review. Others say they're ready for PRR. I was curious what PRR was, and also what we can do about these reports. Sure. Um, I mean, sure. these are kind of the critical thing that the board is here for, and I know in federal court we had a requirement to justify anything that was over six months old pending. And I'm wondering if we wouldn't be advised to get a more fuller, a fuller report on what is the holdup on these, uh, these cases. I mean, saying it's ready for PRR doesn't tell me much. Uh, or that, uh, so what's the, what does that mean? And sure. What are we doing to get these reports out? out because a report more than 12 months old, and some of these are 18 months old, really is not fulfilling our function. And I notice we've, we've had some complaints uh, about the delays in getting these reports out and the reasons for it. Sure. So the PRR stands for Proposed Resolution Report, which is uh, the Proposed Resolution Report, which is what okay. I think that the, the last one that was presented was presented by me. Um, they, they have been, and we talked a little bit about this earlier in our meeting, but um, there have been multiple reasons why those haven't been getting put out. Um, we, are, we are, now we do have a legal advisor in place that can help with that process. Uh, I know that there are at least three that are almost ready to go. Uh, our legal advisor is gonna finish those off and they should be ready for the next board meeting. Um, we did discuss uh, having a, an assembly of board members that would be overseeing why the PRR process is where it is and how to help it to, to move a little bit quicker. We talked about that earlier. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that was all your questions. Yeah, would it be possible at the next meeting to get a more detailed report 
on what the holdup is on any that have been pending more than six months. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Mr. Clausey, uh, Mr. Witzel? Um, I was curious to know, um, <clears throat> you mentioned that you're in the process of addressing the officers who were not turning their cameras on. Have you noticed a pattern with any particular officer or is it, does it seem random? I, I haven't noticed a pattern with any particular officer, no. Or that there's that the majority of the officers are turning them on. Thank you. Sure. There's nothing else we can move on to the next items in our agenda. I'll preface it by saying we don't have some we don't have an MNPD representative who is able to speak on um, the hiring practices. So we're trying to get them scheduled for the next meeting. Uh, but Dr. Valier is going to take us through some policy issues, specifically license plate readers, um, the hiring and background recommendations response, and MNPD's use of a force policy. Um, before we start talking about license plate readers, I want to remind the board that there's two um, bills uh, currently being considered by Metro Council. Um, and if the board is so inclined, we can take a position on which one to support or not support any of them. Um, and I'll let Dr. Valier tell us more about those. All right, thank you. Um, so there's you know, three things on the agenda around policy, so it's a bit of a policy-heavy meeting, so um, I think we'll have a great time. Um, so the first thing, um, there are, as uh, Chair Martinez said, there are two license plate bills that are working through Metro Council. Both of those bills are on second reading at the September 7th Council meeting. Um, and so to prepare for that and speaking with Director Fitcher, uh, we discussed developing a way to try to have help the board understand the different policy landscapes of whether if neither of those bills passed or if one of those two bills passed. Um, so in order to do that, I uh, pulled out a few of the important policy pieces of each bill as well as the current law if neither of those bills passed. Um, it's important to also remember if neither pass, it, it means that there really is very little regulation around license plate readers. And uh, the police department has said that there's interest in purchasing license plate readers that are currently allowed by law and moving forward with some implementation use of license plate leader, readers that are currently allowed. Um, so the, one of the differences between these bills, so there's uh, Bill 582, which is, is sponsored by uh, Johnston, Pulley, Nash, Rutherford, Murphy, Stiles, Toombs, Gamble, Young, Hancock, Druffel, Hall, Withers, Hauser, and Cash, um, would remove all restriction, restrictions on the types of LPRs, so allow both mobile LPRs as well as fixed position LPRs that could be installed on uh, poles on, on roads. Um, 841, which is a is sponsored by council members Rosenberg, Mendez, Suara, Sepulveda, O'Connell, Benedict, Welsh, Parker, Roberts, and Porterfield, um, would only allow license plate readers installed on a law enforcement vehicle. And the term vehicle includes trailers, so it could be a license plate reader trailer. Um, the, there are some differences on the allowed uses in these bills. I'm just going to highlight sort of the key differences between these. Um, if neither bill passes, there would be no restrictions on how the data could be used by the police department. If 582 passes, the data could be used um, for investigating and prosecuting any criminal offense. Um, as well, which includes um, violent crimes or other crimes. So the legislation says investigating and prosecuting criminal offenses and then specifies including but not limited to 
and so in general would allow the use for investigating and prosecuting of any criminal offense. Um, 841 is only allows the use of license plate readers for uh, to identify stolen vehicles or vehicles associated with missing or endangered persons. Uh, vehicles registered to a person with an outstanding felony arrest warrant vehicles for which a probable cause search warrant for a felony offense has been attained. And then there's a amendment that would include um, probable cause for a uh, for arrest for a felony offense. So it specifies that license plate readers would only be used for felony offenses instead of other offenses, uh, misdemeanor offenses. Um, both bills do include some prohibitions. Both would restrict LPRs that would have facial recognition technology or be capable of facial recognition. Um, having rear facing license plates in Tennessee makes it less likely that you would have photos being taken with an identifiable person. Um, but that has been a concern, especially in states with front facing license plates. Uh, the data retention period, if neither bill passes, the state law has a 90 day maximum data retention period. Uh, 582 would have a 10 day data retention period um, unless uh, it's used in an investigation. Um, uh, it must be deleted after 10 days. 841 has a 24 hour retention period unless it's related to a criminal investigation for one of the allowed uses. Um, both include stipulations around equitable distribution around the city. And um, 582 includes that they must be on major and collector street plan, major and collector streets, so major arteries uh, in the city rather than on uh, small streets. Um, I have to turn the page. Um, there are several stipulations around accountability and oversight. Um, both do create a oversight and accountability um, system. In 582, it, there's a requirement that there would be privacy policies, policies and usage policies. The identification of an LPR custodian at the, at the police department who would train users, manage security, conduct audits, and ensure retention or in destruction of data. Um, there would be the audit log would be able to be viewed by uh, two members of council, one member of the community oversight board as selected by the community oversight board. Um, and any, any failures to comply with policy potentially um, is specified that there could be uh, criminal penalties associated with, with violations of policy. 841 um, similarly also has some regulations around accountability and oversight. Um, there must be an audit trail of who's accessing the data and to make sure to ensure compliance, the district attorney general or designated the, or designee, the public defender designee, the chair of the community oversight board or designee and two mem members of council may examine and audit the LPRs, any server used to store data, and records pertaining to LPR use. Um, so both of these do include the Community Oversight Board in different ways. And they are slightly different in how um, the board uh, is included. Um, in 582, it does specify a board member, whereas in 841, it could be the chair's designee, which could include a member of staff. Uh, for transparency and reporting, um, there's none required if neither bill passes. If 582, in, included in 582 is a required report which would be made available to Metro Council. Um, that includes information on the number of uh, vehicles being stopped, the time, date, location, uh, actions based off of stops using LPRs, uh, race and ethnicity of, of vehicles stopped. Um, as well as a few other provisions. Um, there is also required reporting on the numbers of LPR uses, the numbers of matches, and some other information to Metro Council. Um, in 841, there also is requiring a report uh, with, very, with very similar information. 
So they have similar reporting requirements to each other. They both include a pilot phase where there's a six month period and at the end of a six month period, the council has to reevaluate their use and vote to continue the use. So both of them include that sort of six month period where the council does or would have to act again. Um, and there are a couple additional provisions um, that I pulled out in 582. There's provisions that privately owned and operated LPRs um, that provide data to the police department or um, the custodian would have to develop policies and procedures around requesting, protecting, and retaining the data that's consistent with, uh, with, with the, these policies. Um, and in 841, there's also a state preemption provision which states that if the state legislature were to pass a law requiring sharing of LPR data beyond what's allowed in the policy, then uh, the council would have to vote on whether to continue LPR use. Um, so I just wanted to give kind of a breakdown of these three bills side by side, sort of the different policy contexts of uh, what each of these bills would do. And, um, give you the opportunity to discuss what the role of the board is in um, this important policy conversation for Nashville. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Mr. Holloway. Uh, it, it seems like uh, <clears throat> if this bill is passed, if, if any of these bills are passed, it seems like the council will give more than six months to evaluate what kind of results they're doing. It, to me, it seems like 12 months would be better than six because you you look at um, the crime rate at different times of the year. And sometimes, you know, during the warmer months, crime can escalate, I suppose, during the real cold months. And uh, so my thing is, if we do it 12 months instead of six months, if it passed, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Dr. Blair, for an excellent report. Uh, I find the so much assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valier, for that excellent report. I particularly want to commend you and the staff who assisted you in providing a document that is so clear it makes the analysis accessible and understandable. It actually becomes a public teaching document, which is we have taken on as part of our mission. Is this document posted on our COB website so that we may point others to it and they may share it as well? Thank you. Uh, it's not currently online, but it could be tomorrow if you'd like it to be. Please. Thank you. I will send that first thing in the morning. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, so I have a couple questions, but my first question is, is how do we just like some background story? Like how do we get to this point and then some very like baseline functional knowledge of how license plate readers work? Just a very simple. Um, so the first part of how we got here, um, I, I will actually I have the timeline in front of me, so that'll be. Uh, the bill 850 or 582 uh, was filed in December of 2020 and uh, was at the same time was filed 581, which was a smaller bill that would have uh, made a few clarifications, which was filed by um, Councilmember Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, 582 was a more expansive bill that would have that expanded the use of, of license plate readers because currently in Metro code um, in 2017 the Metro Council restricted the use of license plate readers 
uh, uh, that are fixed on the public right of ways and reduce those for um, that use. Um, this bill, or 582, was designed to, to expand that to allow more usage and through a series of amendments as well as public meetings um, which were conducted on WebEx. Uh, there was conversations around the, um, the public perception of license plate readers, uh, the uh, ty different types of license plate readers um, that could be used. Um, and it, the, those, the two bills, by one by Johnston and colleagues and Rosenberg and colleagues tracked together um, and eventually uh, five, er, 581 was uh, withdrawn and 582, I believe it was withdrawn, um, and 582 was deferred indefinitely uh, before the budget season. And it was brought back at the last council meeting, which meant that it was uh, procedurally deferred until the next meeting. Um, the other bill, 841, was filed a few weeks ago. And um, Councilmember Rosenberg has described it as more of a compromise bill that goes farther than he would like as an advocate of privacy. Um, with allowing more uses of license plate readers, but also trying to make some safeguards around regulation and um, privacy and security. Um, and that was filed uh, July 27th. And so they both will be on second reading and will be tracked together at the next council meeting. Uh, and then the other part of your question around sort of Effic or efficacy, I think there, there is a small but growing body of evidence-based policing literature that does show that license plate readers are most effective for recovering stolen vehicles. Um, there's different cities with different implementation strategies. There's um, some cities that have invested more in mobile LPRs that are on, that are on police vehicles. Um, that are used in order to go into areas where there's likely or where they find more stolen vehicles being recovered as a way to identify stolen vehicles. Um, there's also cities that have used them at, in, in fixed positions. Um, there's not great, the evidence-based policing literature is pretty small on license plate readers. Um, one, I think one important study with a similar size city is Charlotte Mecklenburg, who installed 100 license plate, fixed license plate readers in 2012. And a study came out in uh, 2019, um, which was uh, led by Cynthia Lum, who's uh, the director of George Mason's Center for Evidence-Based Policing, and found that license plate readers, the implementation did not have a significant increase in the clearance rate for violent crimes, but what it did do was it helped uh, make arrests quicker. So when there was a license, when there was an identified suspect and a license plate identified, it can um, show where that, that individual is and, and make that arrest more quickly. Um, but it did not have a it did not have a significant increase in the clearance rate. Um, but there is a body of evidence that shows that there is some, you know, especially for recovering stolen vehicles. Though there's also a lot of concerns about data security and privacy, and um, some research has been done on sort of how um, neighborhoods that are policed more tend to have more uh, interactions and more records kept in databases from the LPRs. So, um I guess I, so I was not at the last community oversight board meeting, but I did hear uh, Jonathan Hall mention and talk about, um, council member Jonathan Hall mention and talk about um, how his community members in Bordeaux who are older, um, and I think the specific comment was around how they're comfortable with surveillance. Um, but I did notice that there was never any mention about interacting with young people or talking to young people who are our youngest drivers, who we know from the research are the most, most likely to be pulled over the most and be most likely to have more um, 
communication with law enforcement. So I'm curious if there's any data or studies around how these type of digital surveillance, uh, like a license plate reader, will affect our younger drivers. Um, I'm not aware of any research specifically on that. Uh -huh. um, most of the research on public perceptions of LPRs does not show that a lot of people have a large knowledge base around license plate readers or their use. Um, uh, but I'm not aware of any specifically on young adults or young people. For sure. It did, I just had like two more. Uh, the first one is I noticed uh, two things really missing. Um, and I'm not sure if they're in the legislation. But I remember one, one of the um, bills that were presented directly mentioned Vigilant Solutions as a, um, as a company. And I know the one that's in Haines is Flock. Is there any comment in any one of these policies around what companies would be directly used? Um, neither bill um, deals directly with procurement of how LPRs would be purchased or funded. Um, and so neither specifically talks about contractors. If it is purchased uh, by Metro, then it would most likely have to go through a procurement process in order to identify a vendor. Yeah, and is, it, 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 this is my last question. Is it, a, is it a way that we can know who, how we're going to go about purchasing or financing something like an LPR, especially the pilot, and then growing out the pilot as well? Um, all, so all purchasing would be public records, and so that's something that we could, you know, as if there are, is purchasing happening, uh, you know, we could potentially look at, you know, the process or what contracts are, there are. Um, but all of that information should be public, and if, you know, as this, if this moves forward and there, if it mo is moving in that direction, those are things that we could continue to look at, but I think up front, uh, we don't have a lot of information on you know, specifics of vendors or funding or anything like that. Mr. Hayes. And I do want, want to say an excellent report. Uh, one thing I was wondering, especially if, if it's gonna go online for the public, uh, uh, is there any way you could do a summary of each bill in addition to what happens if it's if neither bill passes, uh, similar to what you did for us, you you really went through it really quite well. Um, I, I could uh, draw from the bill summaries that are produced by the Metro Council Office and and to provide summaries of each bill and uh, give a brief uh, uh, what the current state of the law is. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Uh, the, the license plate reader is kind of like um, when they first started putting cameras in the community. People complained about it, they thought it was going to evade their privacy. But looking at the solvability of, of the crime, that is being accepted more. And so it's going to be the same way if it's passing and we have the license plate reader and, and they see that it's solving crime and it's a need for it, you know. So it's just going to take some time for people to adjust to it. Mr. Brown. Yeah, if I understood the last provision of 582 said that any uh, procurement would be done pursuant to Title IV of the Metropolitan Code. So this is going to go through the normal bidding procedure and all the bidders will be identified and their proposals out, if yes. I understand it. Yes, that's, that should be the procurement process for any sort of major metro purchase. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other questions for Dr. Valier? Yeah, I had a quick clarifying comment. Um, so if I get it, if I heard you correctly, the, what, the, what the numbers in the research tell us is it helps with recovering of stolen vehicles, but it really doesn't have any effect on the clearing of crimes. Did I, did I understand that correctly? I might have worded that wrong, too. Um, I, I think the, the where LPRs are effective is identifying license plates that are wanted for some reason. So whether that is a stolen vehicle or whether that is a vehicle registered to somebody with a felony arrest warrant, um, identifying that license plate is where um, LPRs are more successful. Um, with, I think what the research really shows is that 
they are less effective when there's not a specifically identified license plate already. What, because if, let's say, a crime happens on, this, on a street over, uh, over here and there's a license plate reader four blocks away, the likelihood that the, drive, that the person who committed the crime will drive in front of it is pretty low. Um, it happens, it absolutely happens, and there's cases where, where cars are identified um, with vague descriptions, are then identified with license plate readers. Um, but by and large, the evidence-based policing research shows us that that's less likely to be the case, um, even though there will be cases where it happens. Um, from, but with the, where there is real data that shows that they can be effective, is on recovering vehicles that are stolen or a, a license plate that's already been identified as right. being wanted. Um, and then the next question ends up being what method of identification is used, right? right. And so that's where the fixed LPR versus mobile LPR, LPR. comes in, is which, which is the method that is going to be used for that. Mobile LPRs tend to be able to be used in a more targeted way where fixed LPRs have to, are put over a larger range right. um, and would cover more space. Right. Um, so there, those are some of the considerations that sort of come into thinking about you know, which practice would be best for Nashville. Um, and there's also more, con there are some folks that have brought up more concerns around um, what's being referred to as data valence right. um, instead of surveillance data valence with uh, LPRs, especially around fixed LPRs, and the ability to predict um, movement and, um, but those are some concerns that have been raised by different um, privacy groups. Right. Uh, this is just my last comment, then I'll back away. I, know, I feel like I've been talking too much. Uh, but I did want to say, this feels like we're opening up Pandora's box. Uh, it, it just it just it feels like and it, and it feels like there's a huge humongous appetite to get this done uh you know we kind of caught this in december on like second or third it was it was about to pass if we didn't catch it um and so i don't know what this is you know what i'm saying it feels like something is at play but i do want to mention this this type of technology just feels like incredibly dangerous um and if it's to get out of control, I'm just curious on if we let the license plate, and this is just a comment, if we let the license plate reader in, what's the next thing that we're at in 10 years when it comes to the data surveillance? And then the other piece is, is that although we've been talking about this since December, there has been little to no mention about how we get this paid for. And that, uh, that also feels very dangerous, especially when we're constantly being told, like, other issues can't be solved through the budget because it's a strap budget. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that, especially as we go through a housing crisis and other crises that our communities are experiencing and how it seems like there's just so much appetite to get this type of legislation through. I mean, we got, what, 21 council members supporting these bills? So I just wanted to mention that. Ms. McCree. I have more of a practical question about the license plate readers. Um, you mentioned earlier that it works best if the reader has already picked up the pl license plate number and then it's found somewhere else. How practical are these things at night? Do they pick up plates well? Um, if these are only working during the day and they are only working um, to catch stolen vehicles, how much is this really serving the people of Nashville when it comes to crime, since that is not something it seems to be solving in the first place? Um, well, I can answer the first part of that, right? So, you know, they do use, the cameras do work at night. They use a, like a night vision technology. I am not the sort of hardware person, but um, they do use a, a night vision, so they do are able to work at night uh, and are able to pick up license plates. And I think you raise a good question around sort of the, uh, 
is it the the tool that is correct? And I think that's the conversation that um, you know board that this board can have and um, have that conversation around whether this is the right tool um, to be focused on. Thank you. And just in closing, I. I know there are several cities that are already using this, um, and there are a multitude of crimes that are in, of concern here in Nashville, um, but I don't think stolen vehicles are the top priority um, as of now. And so I, I do, if that's the most effective um, with these license place readers, I just want to raise that for public comment. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Mr. Wynn. Yeah, when I read through your breakdown of the, the bills, I noticed the, some responsibility for the management of, of the data. So, but this is not a police policy. This is just a bill that's to be passed. So, one, do you know what the police department's intentions are on their policy that will, that will govern the use of the LPRs? And will it be similar to the governing of data inside the department, say, for use of IIII or NCIC or any of those federal state databases with punishment for misuse of the data? Um, I, would, I don't know specifically because this would require that there would be internal policies be drafted from the police department. Um, Given that each of these uh, bills does have have strict oversight and ma data management provisions, there would be uh, a, uh, a a focus on ensuring that only authorized personnel would have access. And each of the bills does specify that um, in order to access the data, uh, personnel would have to uh, be would have to specify the reason why they're accessing. That access would have to be logged in, in, in so that it could be audited, um, and then that audit log would be available um, to at least the um, uh, public defender, the district attorney, and the community oversight board. Thank you, Dr. Hilder. Thank you. So I am intrigued by Member Wynn's questions, and to me, it raises the opportunity for us as a board to respond to say, should one or the other of these bills pass, will CO be, read, be ready to stand up a committee that would specifically look at what the policy enforcement would be within the department and to monitor that carefully. If, we, if that subcommittee comes back and informs us that it finds it there's an adequate mechanism in place, then it becomes one of those things that we continue to provide general oversight for. If, however, that knowledgeable committee comes back and informs us that there's a gap, there's a loophole, then that becomes grounds to almost automatically trigger a policy recommendation by this board to plug that gap. So I, I, I don't think that's a motion yet, sir, chair, but I think it's a, pre-motion in the draft box that perhaps we should consider based on the outcome of the council meeting on September 7th. So thank you, Member Wynn, for highlighting that. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. So I want to clarify that whether or not any of these bills pass, MNPD is moving forward with getting license plate readers. That is my understanding um, since they are currently allowed under Metro Code. Um, there is interest in the police department in moving forward with license plate readers. And so passing one of these bills would set some sort of regulatory framework? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kamaguch. Is, is there a, is there a, with that being said, there has to be a conversation already happening. Uh, MMPD already has to be, there already has to be a conversation MMPD is having about policy, preparing themselves for the impl implementation of this. So it, who, and you might not know this, I'm, I'm asking everybody in the room, who would be the person who we could talk to to get insight on what MMPD's policies 
could possibly be when they do get license plate reviews? Uh, we would be able to have conversations with Captain Gilder over strategic development, who's responsible for developing policy. I'm just thinking out loud. Is it a possibility that we could actually in invite them here, or would that be an overstep? No, we can definitely invite them here. Though we have, where exactly are we in the process, Dr. Valier? Um, since these bills are on second reading on the 7th, and then um, I believe 582 by procedure, since it's already been indefinitely deferred once, cannot be deferred again. Um, it will go, if it moves forward from second reading, would be on third reading before the next board meeting. In your opinion, is it better to have um, no bill pass or a bill pass with some sort of regulatory framework? Um, I have opinions on that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel it's my responsibility to defer to the board. Um, I do think that it's important to recognize that there having a regulatory framework in place that's required by Metro Ordinance um, is helpful for make, ensuring that we can do oversight uh, as a department. Um, the, it's, I think, looking at specifically how the oversight board as a body is included in each of the bills may be a helpful step to understanding sort of what oversight would look like if one of these were to pass. Um, and that might be a fruitful um, consideration on the part of the board to, under, so to really specifically look at um, the role of the oversight board. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Uh, Mr. Holloway, do you have? I think um, an opinion from the oversight board is like a civilian opinion to the community instead of from a sworn police department. And basically, that's what we're here for, to represent the community. And another thing I want to say, um, it's not only recording stolen vehicles, it's recording people that using the same vehicle and committing armed robberies and crime like that. Once you do a report on somebody that's doing a crime and you got a license plate number, you put it in the system, and when it go past one of these readers, well, this guy is still out on the street. He's in this area. He's in this part of the town. And it would be a good thing if it's used right. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Um, so is there any um, appetite for the board to take a position on this, given that um, we won't be able to meet until after the next uh, reading. Mr. Brown. I, I would sort of be reluctant for the board to start making recommendations and such in it. This is going to be obviously contested in the council, and at this point we don't have anything to oversee, and so to me, for the board to start taking a position pro, con, one bill or the other, or no bill, uh, I think is getting us into a little bit out of our lane. Uh, if something's passed and policy, police uh, then are adopting regulations and policy to carry it out, then I think we have a function to oversee it. But I'm a, I would be very reluctant to have us start weighing into what's at this point a political decision with the council. I mean, obviously, individual members may have an opinion and certainly can express them, but I'd be reluctant to see the board start weighing in pro archon. Uh, I think we make uh, friends or enemies that we don't need to make uh, uh, unnecessarily at that point. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other comment on that? Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. And I think I disagree. I think I agree with that. What I do think our function is, and I hope it's the red thread that ties my commentary together in this meeting, is we have an absolute opportunity and responsibility to make this issue as transparent 
and as accessible to our community as possible. Therefore, to have this analytical report posted on the website tomorrow and any summary information also posted, perhaps even links to the full text of each bill, mm -hmm. the fiscal note for each bill. Um, sir, the, the, type, the, the provision around procurement is sort of like that's on my homework assignment. You see where we're going? How do we actually curate the syllabus that the people in the community can follow along with and contact us individually or their community organizations and perhaps have some teach-ins about this? But clearly, we need to have the syllabus posted and let people know that the final exam is on September 7th, right? So I think and I'm, I'm so proud of us for doing it that that's part of what we're doing is what we can now maybe is not to take a side, but to be ready to understand it as well as possible and then assert our duty of oversight as soon as we know which way it's going to go. So thank you. Mr. Brown. I would fully agree with that. that uh, putting out information for the public, uh, I think this summary is excellent. And putting out the fa the the uh, bill contents, I think that's all fine. I would strongly recommend that. What I would be concerned about is the the board as a board starting to take a position pro or con. I, I think that's getting out of our lane. But I think the education and the ability to put it out for the members of the public to have an an objective view of what's there is per is absolutely perfect. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Campbell Gooch and then Mr. Holloway. Yeah, I would say it I, I think I think it makes sense uh for us to be that transparent body and to show all of our work. But I also want to mention that there are no sides here. All of these bills lead to us having license plate readers. Uh I could see if there was a bill that was just straight up a ban, then that feels like then that would be two opposing oppositions. But both of these bills, both all, all of these options are license plate readers. So I'm like, if we can hold that transparency, but then also just like give whatever information we have, I think that makes sense. But I did want to mention that there is, there is no bill here that just straight up represents community members who might not want these at all. Um, yeah. Well, uh, being, on, being on this board put us in a position to represent the people. We the eyes and the ears for the people in the community. And whether we like it or not, now if you don't like it, step off the board. But uh, people will look forward to us for questions and answers. And so that's what we're here for, you know. We're not here to run the city, but we have, we're here to make an honest opinion about things that could affect the people of the community. And they would, would like to have a civilian point of view about about this. Mr. Hayes. Since we represent, uh, we, we're, okay, Since uh, this board was put here because uh, there were flaws in, in the people being heard, uh, if we're not going to vote, take a vote on these, I would I would like to see something probably in your language, rather than the technical stuff from the bills themselves, because I really want the people to understand what these bills are, and I don't think it's there now. They don't understand. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, Commander Laura wanted to speak up on this, so I'm gonna give an, an opportunity to do that. Thank you. I just want to make clear, I think there's some confusion on the police department's uh, side. The department s supports LPR technology. Um, but apart from that, the department has no plans at this time to move forward with investing anything into this technology or utilizing LPRs until there's some legislation that's passed. It doesn't make any sense for us to move forward, you know, purchasing anything and we don't know what our parameters are. So I, I want to make sure that there is no confusion, that there's no LPRs, there's not a, um, any 
uh, decision been made to utilize LPRs. We are simply right now waiting to see what legislation passes and then look at the options we have with utilizing that uh, technology. Uh, but until legislative, if neither bill passes, then we're gonna be where we are right now, which is not utilizing LPRs until we have clear parameters uh, and legislation that allows us to. So I just want to make that clear. I think there might've been some confusion. Thank you, Commander Laura. Mr. Kamalgooch. Thank you, Commander Laura, for, yes. for clearing that up. I really do appreciate that. Um, I remember in a previous bill, I think that was withdrawn, where it mentioned that a nonprofit would actually be purchasing the LPR data. I think it was the one that was brought forth by Joy Styles uh, that was trying to do it for drag racing. So that, that was my, that's where I was going with that mm -hmm. question, if there's been any conversation around, because I know also in other cities, they use um, foundations in that manner to pay for digital surveillance equipment. So I was just curious if MBNPD has been having any of those conversations about getting a foundation together to actually pay for these type of uh, surveillance equipment. Sure. At this time, again, we have, no, we have not had any conversations with anybody about uh, getting equipment because there is no legislation and we're not utilizing them, we're not going to utilize them until the legislation is passed. So once legislation passes, then I believe I'm sure the department will start to work with whoever to figure out how they're going to be purchased. But until the legislation passes or not, and we know that we can utilize the, the technology, we're not even starting those conversations because uh, they're, they're for no reason right now because we're not using that. Um, I don't know if that's something that will be in a budget if it does pass or not, or how those will be purchased if they ever, we ever get to the point where we can purchase them. But again, we're basing everything that we do on the legislation first. If the legislation doesn't pass, then we don't utilize LPRs. Um, and if it does, then we'll start, I guess, looking to that. Mr. Wynn. Yeah, Commander, I, I don't expect you to be an expert on sure. license plate readers, but you have an informed opinion about the difficulties of the police department's facing with crime detection, mm -hmm. stolen automobiles, automobiles using other crimes. So what's your informed opinion about this technology, to considering the debate around the country about intrusion of privacy? I think the, the department is, we are fully support the LPR technology as long as the, the proper parameters are put to protect uh, people's uh, privacy. Um, I think the technology can be used. I think the department is willing to use the technology, but we want to make sure that the policies are in place, that the rules are in place, that we know what parameters we have. And some of that comes through legislation. We'll have our own policies, but the legislation will tell us what our true parameters are. Um, and so, again, we want, we think that the technology will definitely benefit the community. Um, but again, we want to make sure that nobody, that nobody's privacy um, is uh, is affected negatively um, if you're using this. You know, we have to have the legislation and we have to have the right policies written before we even think about utilizing them. Thank you. Yes, sir. I want to clarify. There's certain instances where it is legal to be using uh, LPR technology. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So, go ahead. Yes, mobile LPRs are allowed. The only thing that's not allowed under Metro Code is uh, license plate readers installed by Metro government onto the public right of way. Right. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Any other questions, discussion on that? Um, I don't know if we need a motion or not. And if we don't, we can move on to the next item on the agenda, um, but if there isn't, then we can talk about um, hiring practices. Is it here? I, again, if if we're not going to make a recommendation, again, I would like to re-entertain something in layman's terms where people can understand about these license plate readers. Yes, I can work on a summary that try that summarizes this uh, in a more, try to be more accessible um, and in providing some of the, these points in a narrative format. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, so we did receive the response on the hiring procedures report. And just as a reminder, there were 10 recommendations in that report. Uh, this was received uh, prior to the last board meeting while I was out of town. Um, and so we are, uh, that's why it was put off, uh, deferred until tonight. Um, the chiefs responded to the, uh, to the 10 recommendations. Um, and uh, since there was no, the recommendation was not listed on the response, I took the, re the response from the police chief and copied it onto a new form with the recommendation. So the language is verbatim when under where it says MMPD response. It's verbatim from the police chief, um, but does, I did do some formatting, adding bullet points in order to make it a little bit uh, easier to understand. Um, so out of the um, 10 recommendations, I believe eight of them were accepted and there was two partially accepted recommendations. Um, so if we sort of go through recommendation one, that the personal history statement should include law enforcement specific questions for applicants who have been law enforcement officials in another jurisdiction. And they should, that should include questions about unnecessary use of force, bias-based policing, and any disciplinary actions. Um, that was uh, an acceptance. And there uh, were some uh, questions that were similar that get to uh, similar questions around uh, being fired or discharged included in the response. Um, but it's not necessarily clear what specific questions would be added or what the timeline is for adding any additional questions specifically on uh, use of force. And I think it's important also to specify that we do, you know, expect that, that disciplinary records are get got are received from departments um, in the background investigation process, but the personal history statement would be a way to sort of triangulate what a, what a applicant is saying about their own history with the disciplinary file that's received from another department. Um, the second recommendation um, was that the question 99 of the personal history statement uh, about whether applicants have a prejudice that would impact their job performance should be changed to a series of questions focused on discriminatory attitudes and behaviors and a short answer question regarding the applicant's understanding of implicit bias. Um, that response is focused on implicit bias test questions, um, and I'm not clear whether there's will be specific implementation of a question on awareness of implicit bias from the response. Uh, the third recommendation was to evaluate civil service testing no-shows um, and to aim to have a 50% uh, of invited applicants take the civil service tests. Um, it does, their response is that they are working to uh, reach out to applicants who fail to appear and uh, they've increased the rate uh, to 36% this year from last year's 32%. So they say they are making progress in that. And I do hope that they're able to continue that progress um, with some of the changes that they've been making in recruitment. Uh, recommendation four was that the public, or that the planned evaluation report uh, focused on the physical agility of the civil service testing, which was changed um, that that report evaluating that be publicly released um, and specifically to look at whether that decreases the racial and gender, gender disparities in attending and passing the test. Um, I do wish we had someone to specify since it does say that, you know, the, this information can be readily available based on request um, and we'll continue to explore ways to better our transparency. Um, so I do wonder whether that acceptance is, it will be publicly released or whether it will have to be by public records request. Um, recommendation five is that 
Uh, MMPD should work to increase the racial, ethnic, gender, age, and language diversity of the recruitment section's background investigators to align with the Nashville population more closely and to make progress towards diversification by the end of 2021. And uh, the response does give the uh, race and gender breakdown of recruitment personnel, background investigators, and support staff. And um, they are, it does state that they're working towards diversifying. Recommendation six um, is that MMPD should review at least annually the demographics of applicants that have been assigned to background investigators and the number of disqualifications resulting from each investigator uh, to identify potential biases. One investigator having higher disqualification rates for a specific demographic group does not necessarily indicate bias, but it suggests that a more in-depth audit is needed. Um, this was accepted as well. Um, and it, as, as we move forward, we'll look at how, how this will be implemented and it'll be interesting to see how they uh, decide to implement this. Um, recommendation seven, uh, we re the board recommended that the standard, the standard operating procedures address the timing of the so social media review and the hiring process and the procedures used by, per by MMPD personnel for reviewing social media content. This should include a standard solicitation progress regarding applicant social media inf information and then applicants who refuse to supply access to social media accounts should be disqualified from the hiring process. Um, this was partially accepted. Um, it's not clear uh, which part is accepted and which part is not from the response. Um, so w we would like to more information on which part of this is, will be accepted. I think it's really important, um, especially the, the part around refusing access to social media accounts uh, be a disqualifying um, part or be disqualifying for applicants. Uh, recommendation eight was that standard operating procedures should require that an, if an applicant is a subject of a criminal investigation after review by the deputy chiefs of police panel, regardless of the investigation's outcome, the, the panel must review the applicant in context of the applicant's full background investigation and revote on the applicant's qualification status. And the response says that this is incorporated with the standard operating procedures. Um, Recommendation nine was to add the executive director of the COB or their designee as a voting member to the deputy chiefs of police panel. Um, this was partially accepted uh, from the response. It's not clear what the ne if any next steps and if no next steps are sort of identified, then it seems more like a rejection than, an than a partially accepted recommendation. And recommendation 10, is that the recruitment section standard operating procedures should address conflicts of interest of the deputy chiefs of police panel and direct panelists to recuse themselves from deliberating or voting on an applicant's qualification when they have a personal or business relationship with an applicant. This was already in place for background investigators and other recruitment personnel, but it did not apply to the deputy chiefs of police or designees who actually were the ones deciding whether the person was qualified or not. So that um, will be in included in the new, in revisions to the standard operating procedures. And I apologize, there's an 11, I said there was 10. Um, 11 um, says that MMPD should evaluate the pre-academy employment program to determine whether it improves training academy outcomes and early employment outcomes compared to those who did not participate in the program and release a public report on the program. Um, they, and the response gives some information on uh, recruits who've la left the current training as well as the previous training. Um, and I hope that the evaluation uh, will show that that's an effective program because it is a very interesting uh, program in order to employ officers while they're waiting to start academy in the department so they, as civilians so they learn more about the department have more educational materials before they start the, the academy and learn some about you know what goes on in the department, some of the legal aspects are working on physical fitness. And uh, I think that's a very promising program. So I hopefully that evaluation will be um,
forthcoming as they have several recruit class classes with enough data to be able to do that. So uh, that uh, is the response that we received. And so I, I would, if board members have any feedback or comments, um, that would be great. Mr. Hayes. Thank you. Uh, there was there was quite a bit of commentary uh, in the in the replies to these, which I'm I'm kind of confused on that. But uh, under item one, I'm really concerned that these are policies uh, that MMPD has in place. For example, it says number one fourteen. It's asking, apparently asking the applicant, have you ever been discharged, asked to resign, laid off, a subject to disciplinary action while in any position except military? Uh, seemed like that would present a lot of people from really wanting to even be on the police department because just because they were laid off, I've been laid off. But it, it, was, it wasn't because of anything that I did. I was laid off, but I, I don't even see why that's even a question. So some of these questions here, I don't know if we need to relook at these. I'm, I'm just surprised that these are questions that are being asked applicants. So, so these questions are not disqualifying questions. Um, these questions are in the packet of background information that a applicant would turn in at the, before their background investigation begins. So these are questions that if you check yes, you're able to provide an explanation. So if you say, yes, I've been laid off, you know, here is the context behind it. They can then ask about it if there's any concerns. So these, these would not necessarily exclude somebody from working at the police department, but it gives the background investigators a, um, a starting point for their background investigation. So if you were to say, yes, I was laid off and it was because my boss was a real, was terrible and I hated my boss and he was a real jerk. Well, then the background investigators might know, well, I need to go ask that boss. Was it, you know, I need to go ask them. I need to do a cert, like, find out more information about the context about that. Because it could be that it was a totally reasonable disagreement or it could have been, but it also could be indicative of that person, of that person's, uh, how they operate in a job. So questions like that are not necessarily disqualifying. They have, they have to be graded or like understood within the context and as a way for background investigators to uh, understand a applicant as a sort of a whole person and then understand that within context. I'm just saying there are cases where it's like, okay, you're at a big manufacturing facility. We didn't get that part and they had to lay so many people off. Our company is sold and, you know, things like that. But I just, I just still, I guess I don't understand background investigations, but I, I do not understand why that question is even there, especially the layoff. I just, I just, I just don't understand. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, Mr. Brown. Yeah, I had one question looking at the same one that uh, Mr. Hayes was. In 104, we ask if you've ever been subject of a disciplinary investigation in the military, and 114, we come around and we ask, have you ever been discharged, asked to resign, or subject to disciplinary action, except military? So we ask them if they've ever been subject to an investigation in the military, but we exclude if they actually got disciplined. That, I, I just noticed that, but that, that makes no sense at all. There is a section specifically on military, which includes information about any disciplinary procedures in the military, as well as getting military records for discharge. And uh, they're required to sign a, a permission form to get military records. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Holloway and then Ms. McCree. Well, I mean, you think about 114 being a little harsher, but uh, it's really bringing things out. It is it, 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 not. Um, Bland side of the department because it could come up in the future and they want to know why you didn't have the answer to this or why didn't you see this or uh, did you know this? But if you face this up front, then you will know from this person and you give this person time to explain himself, you know, 
so he can clarify, you know, but at least you will know and it won't uh, put the department on the blind side in the future. I have a question um, regarding recommendation five, and this might be more so for you, Captain Laura. Um, so I remember going through the, um, the CPA, and while going through that process and program, there was an initiative the recruiter talked to us about that um, they're looking to increase the department, um, their female presence in the department by 30%. Is there any way to track that progress as you all move forward in diversifying the department? Uh, I believe there is a way to track it, I'm sure. Um, I will have to get back with the background recruiting to see exactly what process they're using, but I can get that information for you if you need me to. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions for Dr. Hildreth? Thank you. So I am intrigued about the partial acceptance of seven and the partial acceptance and the possible actual interpretation that it's a cloaked rejection. And so I'm wondering of the board, what do we do with that? This is sort of a case of first impressions, as you know, as we're just now doing these. We're very grateful to the chief and the department for giving us responses. And I think there's great encouragement for the number of acceptances. But now when we get to these difficult places, board, what do we do with this? Uh, do we want to have a process where we ask for um, further clarification? Are we actually asking Chief Drake to come before us and, and we talk it out? Or are we asking um, our executive director and her counterpart in the department to have sort of softer conversations? What is it we think we need to do next? Or are we comfortable leaving these partials hanging? I, I, I'm asking the question. I don't know. And I'm wondering what the wisdom of the board will surface here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clausey. Sure. I just wanted to let you know as, as a kind of a response to that, I had talked with uh, Commander Lara prior to this meeting. Somebody was supposed to be here uh, to discuss those issues. Um, and as they looked more closely at some of the questions that might be raised, they, they decided that they wanted to bring somebody else who was more closely behind making those decisions. That person wasn't available today. But they will be available next week if we want them, if the board wants them to come, they would be glad to come to that meeting. Thank you. So I think as a follow up chair, I'd like to recommend, maybe this is a motion, that going forward, when we have this call and response process, a refinement is if there's a partial acceptance or if there's a rejection, that at the next available board meeting, that a representative, the appropriate representative from the department come and be prepared to say a little bit more about what that was. And so then we're not wasting time. You follow this? We're not another 30 days out wondering. So I'm very grateful that you had started that and that that almost happened. And I think that gives us an opportunity to maybe turn that into, do you want that to be a motion? Okay. Uh, Second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Heldreth. Uh, any focused discussion there? So the motion is to um, request the presence of the appropriate MNPD personnel member um, that can speak on a partial acceptance or rejection of a policy proposed by the COB. Correct. <laughs> um, no, if there's no focus discussion, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. So the motion passes. Um, I want to also recommend putting this up for public comment. Um, and it could be a step in the process before we um, actually start going back to MNPD is putting it up for public comment so that the public can weigh in and say um, what they want us to bring in, bring up to MNPD as well. Mr. Campbell Gooch. And uh, on that note, these were brought up by the NAACP, correct? Yes, the, that's how the report originated. Okay, and have, uh, what 
what has communication with them been like? Um, I've, I've sent the report and recommendations and asked for any feedback from the president of the NAACP. And um, I believe Director Fitchard has had uh, more conversations about, uh, about that. Yeah, but I haven't heard any specific feedback regarding the report. Yeah, I would also be curious on like what they think, whether they, you know, come in front of the board. I know you said public comment, but I think that would be fire to have them come and give comment on it on the back end too. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I'm I guess at the next meeting when we have a representative from MNPD who can speak on it also um, get make sure that we have NAACP's take on it as well. And then we can move on to the use of force policy revision. All right. Um, so last month, uh, the, I think the day of the board meeting last month, uh, the board was provided with uh, an updated use of force policy and roll call training. Um, this has been, uh, this comes from many recommendations from different groups from the Policing Policy Commission that was formed by the mayor. Um, the, the COB has released two reports that um, are focused on use of force that make recommendations. Um, so there's a lot of recommendations sort of coming together uh, within this policy, which uh, so I attempted to try to um, color code some of these recommendations um, around whether or not they've been incorporated into the uh, policy. Um, and the Community Oversight Board has made 10 recommendations in total regarding use of force. Um, and that was in the eight can't wait report as well as the uh, uh, policy advisory report on use of force consent decrees that was based off of Department of Justice recommendations to other cities uh, during the consent decree process. Um, starting with the eight can't wait, uh, the department had accepted our, the, rec the board's recommendation on banning chokeholds and strangleholds and updated their language and issued a roll call training um, that specifically prohibits those. Um, the board recommended a uh, revision to the de-escalation policy um, that specifically stated that a physical force could, should only be used as a last resort. Um, the department did a partial acceptance on that recommendation um, and did not want to use the language of last resort. Um, I'll point out that that was also in, the, in a policing policy commission recommendation and that also, uh, they all had also recommended the language of last resort. Um, but the de-escalation policy was revised in order to, which it fits with the board's recommendation that um, not using reasonable de-escalation tactics when circumstances permit should make the officer subject to disciplinary action. Um, so that is now incorporated into the use of force policy. Um, the third recommendation was the banning shooting at moving vehicles recommendation. The board's recommendation was based off of the police executive research forums recommendation that uh, specified that uh, the only circumstance where shooting at vehicles should be allowed is when the occupant of the vehicle is using deadly force other than the vehicle itself. Um, MMPD's policy does prohibit shooting at moving vehicles unless absolutely necessary to protect the life of, of the employee or others. Um, and this was, the, this, so this policy is unchanged. And so we did not hear an official response on this policy recommendation. Um, and since actually the week after the board released their recommendation, the Police Executive Research Forum revised their recommendation slightly um, in June 2020, um, stating that agencies should adopt a prohibition against shooting at or from a moving vehicle unless someone in the vehicle is using or threatening deadly force by means other than the vehicle itself or the driver is attempting to use the vehicle as a weapon of mass destruction in an apparent terrorist attack. Um, 
So, I, you know, I think these are very similar, but that language of uh, other than the vehicle itself was not incorporated. So I marked that one with a, uh, that it was not uh, incorporated. Um, the now moving on to the consent decrees report, uh, we the board recommended that uh, MMP review policies and procedures and trainings to ensure consistency between policies in the manual and prohibitions that are covered in training. And through this revision process, it does seem that uh, uh, there's been many clarifications made and to the to the use of force policy that does make it more explicit. Um, the uh, number five, MMPD should implement promotional and annual in-service training that focuses on conducting use of force investigations. This training should be in addition to the annual in-service training provided to all sworn officers. And uh, we gave recommended uh, training topics including conducting use of force investigations, strategies for directing other office, uh, officers to minimize use of force, and intervene, uh, incident management, supporting officers who report unreasonable, unreported force, or who feel retaliated against for only using reasonable force. Um, the department uh, has begun conducting trainings, um, and uh, Commander Lara uh, told us that the command level leadership has received trainings focused on use of force investigations. And this will be required for lieutenants and sergeants as well. And those will be rolling out. Um, and we will also continue to look um, to try to understand more, have our investigators uh, go through that training as well and um, look at what that training entails. Uh, the number six, um, MMPD should create a crisis intervention team. Uh, the crisis intervention co-response program is currently active in its pilot phase, so that you know is already in, in practice and um, has been a major endeavor uh, to roll that out. Number seven, MMPD should categorize all use of force above unresisted handcuffing to three levels that will guide the reporting and investigation of use of force. Uh, this was a partial acceptance from the police department. Uh, the partial acceptance indicated that uh, the MMPD accepted the reporting threshold for any force above unresisted handcuffing, but not the three-level categorization. Uh, the three-level categorization would split into level one force, which currently is not reportable force. So when soft, empty hand control is used to make an arrest or control a subject, um, that is not reportable and is not currently tracked in any systematic way. Level two force is what is currently level two and three force is anything above soft empty hand control or soft empty hand control that is alleged to have an injury. And that is being tracked with a form 108, which requires a supervisor investigation, interviews with the subject officers and um, and so we have data on that. Uh, the recommendation uh, was to be was to have a tracking mechanism and have a reporting mechanism where we could understand how much soft empty hand control is being used to make an arrest, which is an important part of understanding the full force continuum, how often it's being used, um, and really, you know, if, if we're thinking about uh, intervening with officers who may need more training or education, having early warning systems, understanding when low levels of force are used is uh, very important. Um, and so in our recommendation, in our discussion of our recommendation, we had discussed the different cities have different ways of reporting these. They usually don't require a full investigation from a, you know, with uh, up the chain of command, but can be short forms or um, there's some cities who include them on incident reports where an officer would check, I had to use, you know, this escort technique and write a sentence about the type of, of technique that was used to make the arrest. Um, and Commander Lara did state, say to me that um, they are requiring um, officers to inform their supervisor when that occurs, but not to track um, those in any 
on a form or track those in a way that we can then recover. Um, so that's, that's the reason why I included the uh, red not included uh, because the reporting threshold continues, is, is still uh, the same, that soft empty hand control without an allegation of an injury is not being tracked. Uh, number eight uh, is related to a force investigation team being created as a branch of OPA that would investigate criminal administrative aspects of uses of force resulting in serious injury, all firearm discharges, misapplications of force, and other serious uses of force as defined by the department. And they should also investigate fatal uses of force for violations of administrative standards parallel to the TBI criminal investigation and the unit should receive specialized training conducting use of force investigations. Uh, the Office of Professional Accountability's standard operating procedures was updated to include a paragraph um, similar to the recommendation, um, but it says that the FIT team uh, shall review any uses of force resulting in uh, death or serious bodily injury, so conducting the administrative review, um, and that FIT may review any firearm discharges, uh, misapplications of force, or other serious force. So it does not require them uh, to be the person investigating those. Um, the standard operating procedures uh, were not changed other than that the addition of that paragraph. And um, uh, the policy, the revised use of force policy states that the criminal investigation division or precinct investigative units will investigate firearm discharges and deadly force. So there, I think there are some mismatches between, um, and over, we, there is need to sort of clarify what that procedure is, the responsibilities of the force investigation team and the responsibilities of OPA in many of these, in some of these instances, especially um, the firearm discharges, misapplications of force, and specifying who will be responsible in some of those instances. Uh, number nine, um, track is analyzing and tracking use of force data and making a publicly available report is now included in the policy, so that is required by policy. Um, and 10, MMPD should publish an interactive dashboard. And while this is not in the policy manual, it's, it's actually in progress. Um, I give a yellow symbol, because it's still in progress. I actually did review the dashboards that uh, the Strategic Development Office is creating and working to put online, which would have all of this information about use of force um, available to the public in a, I think, a really comprehensive way. Um, so there is progress being made on making that publicly available. Um, as part of this review, I also looked at the Policing Policy Commission recommendations because that was another area of recommendations that was made around use of force. Um, the majority of those were completed. Um, so in requiring de-escalation, um, failing to require de-escalation could result in disciplinary action. Um, I had already mentioned the last resort, um, as well as shooting at moving vehicles. Um, there was a recommendation from the Policy Commission to stop teaching excited delirium at the Police Training Academy, um, and that's included in the uh, in the use of force policy as a definition, as well as in um, instructions around summoning EMS, and uh, and so that's still that is included in policy. Um, they do did conduct a review of the use of force. Um, there, there was a recommendation that uh, uh, to include clearer policy using specific techniques, and including charts of. A uh, pyramid of de-escalation techniques and use of force and incident decision-making model. Uh, there was not the inclusion of those um, visual aids that are used uh, to teach about uh, these topics. Um, so, uh, 
number eight in that section, soft empty hand control was defined in the new, in the revision. Number nine is, is requiring form 108 um, in those instances that I mentioned where soft empty hand control was used. Um, and so that was a, also a recommendation from the Policing Policy Commission that was not incorporated into the use of force policy. Um, and developing a clear definition of broad terms like serious bodily injury and injury in determining disciplinary actions. And so those have been added to definitions. And uh, finally, um, if in the event that a use of force results in the admission to the hospital, remove officers from line of duty, um, that threshold of admission to the hospital is not included, um, likely because you can be admitted to the hospital for a variety of reasons. Um, but they did specify in the use of force um, that, ser that bodily injury that creates risk of death, uh, causes serious permanent disfigurement, or, or impairment, uh, that officer would be removed from the line of duty. So that I would consider, I said that was partial. Um, so, so this is trying to um, just sort of easily boil down sort of a complicated policy uh, based on all the recommendations that have been given by different groups. Um, so I'm happy to answer as many questions as I can or uh, open it up for your discussion on some of these policies. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Mr. Hayes. I do want to want to say I, I do appreciate MMPD actually including quite a few items that was on the consent decree report. Um, the report, uh, one thing I, I do have a concern with is uh, the report showed a lot more detail. Uh, for example, it put examples uh, with some things that I actually mentioned. For example, uh, there was like a section 1.5 that says practical procedural just, justice techniques, such as, as explain the member's actions and responding to questions, directly answering questions about why the police are there are taking action, and also decreasing the exposure of the potential threat by moving to a safer position. It gives specific examples. And uh, the reason why I say I, I do appreciate the work that was done because it, it looked like initially there was only one sentence on de-escalation in the, in the previous policy. They did go to two pages, but when I look at like Baltimore, there's like about six pages on de-escalation. And I just feel that we strengthen de-escalation, you know, there may be less use of force, but uh, that's something that I feel is missing. A lot of the details that are there, especially in the Baltimore uh, policy. And that was my concern. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Kamelgooch? Yeah, um, can you go, can you make some comments on why, it's in, why it was a recommendation that we say include the language last resort and, and why that's important? And then the second piece, if you could also talk about the shooting at uh, moving vehicles. Yeah, I can talk about those. Um, so the language of last resort, the, the main source that we used is from the policing projects revision uh, or work with, um, uh, oh, Camden, New Jersey. Sorry, it had to take me a second. Um, Camden, New Jersey's use of force policy, which was um, held up as, as one of the uh, model use of force policies that was really uh, created through a democratic focus with uh, community engagement and was really focused around values of, uh, of force should be the last option. Um, exhausting all of the sort of de-escalation techniques if they're practical, right? If, they're, if it's practical, if it's safe, um, exhausting those, and only if you have to, then you result to physical force. And that's, that's where we discussed that language of last resort. 
um, as, as a specific example, um, but it's also been incorporated in other recommendations um, around, um, around uh, I believe the ACAN weight specifically used that language of last resort. And um, so we've thought as we were developing the report and discussing it with the board that incorporating that sort of value statement was important um, because at the end of the day, policies are about values. And so really, I think when you read the new use of force provision, as, as Mr. Hayes said, you read the purpose and you can see value, the values coming through around de-escalation, around you know, only using what's absolutely necessary. And last resort was, was, a, was intended to be that kind of value statement around you can use, like, there are situations where officers are going to be required to use force. And, but we have a, but the value should be that that's the last option. Right. Um, it doesn't mean that it is, it, that it can't be used. It doesn't mean that every single escalate, escalating part of the force continuum has to be used before you can jump to the necessary force option. Well, what it does mean is that there's a value in the department that force is never what's jumped to first or is not the first option. And so that's why we specifically included that language of last resort um, and why that was incorporated in the recommendation and also why um, as we've been evaluating de-escalation time after time, we continue to say that this recommendation was not met in the in the same way, um, because that I do believe is an important piece of uh, of that recommendation. Um, as far as the shooting at moving vehicles, um, you know I I do I, I believe the department does have a a a rather direct and strict prohibition on shooting at moving vehicles, unless absolutely necessary. Um, the, you know, the reason why, you know, the, there's sort of a debate, and I think this is, there's been a debate nationwide among people doing police policy of whether, you know, you should have that sort of prohibition on, on you know, you, the vehicle being used in a way that could cause deadly, it could be used in a way that's deadly. Um, is, that an, is that an area where shooting is, it would be the better option for an officer, decision for an officer to make. And so there are debates, you know, in the policy space around it. Um, the recommendation that we, that the board, that we developed in this policy proposal, the board endorsed, was based off of the Police Executive Research Forum's uh, policy recommendation, which was specifically to exclude that as, as a potential. And the reason why the, that was excluded was that in those situations where a vehicle may be being used in a way that could cause uh, physical harm or death, uh, disabling the driver could actually cause more damage and more harm. Um, so that, you know, that is a, debate and the, so the recommendation that we developed was, was based off of um, the organizations that I, I would consider experts on this, like PERF, um, which uh, has that recommendation. And then also that uh, updated recommendation that also includes for mass casualty terrorist incidents. Thank you, Dr. Villier. Any other questions or um, Mr. Wynn? Yeah, and a, a couple of things. You, you've mentioned PERF several times. Do you use any policy recommendations from Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives? Um, I have not had a lot, read a lot of specific policy work from them, um, but I'm would be very interested in more um, knowing more about what their policy positions are. Okay. I'm a member, so I, maybe I can Absolutely. get you that. Okay. The other thing is, um, my recollection is when tracking use of force for Metro, historically, the psychological services 
section of the department under Dr. Green. She passed away. She's not there anymore, but was collecting data on all use of force by all officers for profiling early intervention for psychological issues. And I know it's probably off topic a little bit, but it seems to me part of the responsibility would be to, to look at all use of forces an officer uses. Are they still doing that in Metro? Um, I don't know if it's happening through psychological services. They, there is a contract to have early intervention systems. So there is, there is a system set up that uh, was developed by um, data scientists at the University of Chicago that um, pulls in use of force records and arrest re records and all kinds of information on traffic stops and Terry stops and, right. um, and creates a risk profile for every officer. And they're able to then um, develop a risk score for early intervention. So I don't know if that's happening through, I believe that's happening through sort of the uh, research and evaluation or IT side. Um, but I don't know if uh, the psychological services uh, would also have some of that information and uh, be de also dealing with that. Well, my understanding they were tracking it at, at one time, which would be pretty valuable, mm -hmm. right down to the first line supervisor's duties to evaluate their officers to see how much force they're using and if it adds up to something more serious. Um, and then critical incident debrief, is that, do you know much about that process? Uh, yeah, so psychological service does do critical incident debriefings. Um, they respond to all officer-involved shootings and do debriefings with all the officers. Um, they've also, they've responded, I believe, um, when uh, an officer is shot in the line of duty, they also mm -hmm. do work with the entire precinct and do critical incident or, or do trauma debriefings. And they uh, do have quite a, uh, a reputable uh, psychological services department that does a lot of work with uh, debriefing officers as well as victim services. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Any other questions or comments on that? If there's not, is this something too that we go through the process of inviting a representative from MNPD to uh, comment on the policy, um, the proposed policies that they didn't accept or were partially accepted? Um, I think that's a question that I would bring back to the board as a whole, what the next steps that you all think are necessary with these recommendations now that we've gone through sort of what's been accepted, the revisions, and I think, you know, there have been many, many changes. Um, and, you know, I think many of the recommendations that the board has made have either been accepted or partially accepted. And so I guess the, I would bring that back to the board of what the next steps should be specifically on recommendations that may not have been fully accepted or, or implemented. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. With respect to the question of what's the next step, I think I understood the motion to be a process motion so that whenever there is a policy discussion and there is a stoplight analysis, may I compliment you on the colors? Very helpful, right? So when we are seeing yellow and red, meaning there's partial or rejection, my intent was whenever we have this, for calendaring, if we know on the agenda that this is going to be presented to the board and we know that there are yellow and red zones, that at that meeting the appropriate representatives be invited and be prepared to speak to them in real time. So it, it was intended to cover all such occurrences. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Any other questions or comments on that. So we'll work on getting um, the appropriate MNPD representative to come to the next meeting then. Um, thank you so much for this work, Dr. Valier. I think I speak for everyone that we're really grateful um, and yeah, amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Um, next on the agenda is public comment, I believe. I don't have it in front of me. Let's, yes, I don't know, Mr. Clausey. We, we, we had we none. Had, we didn't have any public comment. Sorry. All right. I apologize. All right, you have three minutes. Three minutes. Thank you. Hello, I'm Erica Perry. I'm an attorney in Nashville and a community organizer. I just have a few thoughts. One, thank you for your time here. Um, one I wanted to name that I think it's important for us to know that um, I think there was a question around diversity in policing, or at least as it concerns women, and that uh, from the data that I've read, uh, including more women or people of color or black people in the police force, doesn't actually mitigate the harm of uh, policing. Uh, the other thing I think is important to name is that while I think transparency is important, um, and I'm a huge advocate of democratizing the law um, and making sure that our people understand ordinances, I do want to name that transparency in the law does not address the injustice of the law, um, which leads me to my third point. Uh, a decision not to make a choice on, uh, I think, the two proposals that uh, Dr. Vernier, did I say your name right? Uh, spoke about, I think is a choice, especially as we concern, and, and, and I was reading the license plate reader ordinances as they were proposed are extremely problematic. I think because, as I understand it, what would happen is a license plate reader would read that um, a person driving a vehicle, that license plate uh, is either stolen or has been involved in maybe some other criminal activity. And then the police go and use that to, I, I guess, find folks. And if that works in that way, it means it increases our community members' encounter with the police, which also increases the probability of possibility of harm by the police. And so I would propose, and I'll say this at city council meeting in September, uh, that they ban license plate readers. Uh, I was a bit confused because I thought that um, license plate readers were just something that were, was already in place and that we just needed to make a, a policy around it. Uh, but from my understanding, um, and I look to you to kind of take leadership on that to encourage city council to not enforce uh, or pass any type of ordinance. Uh, because I, I do want to encourage city council, um, and maybe you can pay some, play some part in it, uh, to think about other ways to address um, uh, I guess, uh, harm in our community or the issue of stolen vehicles. And so as we know, Atlanta has license plate readers. There are cities across the country who have those. And uh, we might know that uh, crime hasn't gone down. And so I think that it's important that we think about other solutions to address harm and crime in our community. And, and maybe that's something that this board can take up uh, as a way to begin to mitigate the harm of policing our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Any new business or announcements? I have one change that we're gonna make. The next meeting is gonna be on the 29th instead of the 22nd. Um, otherwise, we were gonna have to meet in the jury room. So in order to avoid that, we're, we move the next meeting to the 29th. Any other new business or announcements? Is your, it's, it's okay. Um, if not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Second. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.net.